Hey everyone and welcome to part two of our episode with Molly Galbraith, the woman in charge of Girls Gone Strong. Hopefully you've already listened to part one, but if you haven't, perhaps go back and start from there. Otherwise, continue on here with part two where we talk about things like imposter syndrome and why as a health and fitness professional, you need to be putting stuff out, even if you think everyone else has already done this before. Crack on with it. Hope you enjoy the episode, share it with your friends and send us a message. Let us know what you think. Hi, welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physio Detective. And I'm Marika Hart from Herosphere. Together we interview leading authorities, we answer questions and share our thoughts to provide the general public with the best quality information that we can find on all aspects of women's health. Please remember that the materials and the content on this podcast are intended as general information and they're for entertainment purposes only. They're not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Now sit back, grab your favourite beverage, or do your thing, and enjoy the show. Um, okay, we this is a totally uh, totally different topic. We're just doing a little segue across. Uh, this question is from Kavitha from the Coaching and Training Women uh, Group. Sorry, this is a Girls Gone Strong Coaching and Training Women Group. I'm assuming everyone who's listening is a member, but if you're not, go and join. Um, lots of health and fitness professionals. How many have we got now? Like 15,000 or something? 32,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, slight misestimation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> wow, I didn't realise. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, really supportive group. Um, mm-hmm. Really, really good. I love it. We have awesome experts in there like Marika and other GGS Academy curriculum developers who are in there answering questions. And then we it's a really just well-moderated positive, uplifting, helpful group where you can connect with people all over the world who are currently health and fitness professionals or thinking about becoming one. So there's my little plug for it. Uh, The question is, sorry if my question sounds ageist, where are the aging female coaches? What challenges, if any, are they facing, i.e. employment and recognition? And there were a few people who contributed to this conversation. Um, and just, yeah, saying that there just doesn't seem to be a lot of representation of women in their 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s within the fitness industry, which Molly's smiling and nodding going, yes. Um, and I'll come back and I'll read one of the really lovely comments that was in there. But your take on that, Molly? Yeah, so I, I can't, I, I didn't see that. But hearing that, I'm not totally certain if she's saying there aren't a lot of quote unquote aging. Um, it's funny, whenever we talk about like aging, right, it's like the the older you get, the more you want to push like the aging, like you're like, oh, well, like I'm, I'm 35. So clearly she's talking about 60 and up, right? Whereas when I was in my twenties, I would have been like, well, 40 and up is aging, you know? So it's like we have, when we have articles about like how to train older clients and one of the women who wrote them, she's in her forties and she's like, well, like technically I'm talking about people 40 and up. She's like, as much as I hate to say it, like that's what I'm talking about people 40 and up. Um, so I'm curious if Kavitha's talking about there aren't that many older female coaches or there are older female coaches and they aren't being properly represented. Do you know which question she's asking, Marika? Um, I think where are, part of it is one of the questions is where are they? And the other one is what challenges, if any, are they facing? Okay. So where are they? I think, I think that's a, that's a super fair question. Now, one thing to keep in mind, so by and large, women are underrepresented in a lot of places and by and large, the more, um, uh, more marginalized groups that a woman is in the less likely she is to be represented. Right. So this has to do with age. It has to do with race. It has to do with gender identity. It has to do with sexual orientation. It has to do with, you know, socioeconomic class and body size. It's like the the further you get away from young, white, fit, well-educated, upper middle class, like the, the less represented you are in basically every place and space. So that's, that's, I just want to say that as kind of like a broad general statement. Um, then, you know, if you think about the health and fitness industry, and Dr. John Berardi talks about that, this in his book, Changemaker, like we're a really young industry. We've only been around for what, 30 to 40 years, something like that. I mean, he talks about, I think it was Dr. Ken Cooper, who's like the 
grandfather of aerobics or whatever started running for fun in like the maybe 70s and people would literally throw stuff at him because they, they didn't know what he was doing and they were so confused about like why what's this guy running from we don't understand in modern health clubs as we know it again have only been around for maybe 40 something years so the field of health and fitness is relatively young in general and as you can imagine 40 years ago, again, I'm not sure what year Title IX was passed here in the United States, but it gave basically, uh, was supposed to give equal access and representation to girls sports. Um, but, you know, there were fewer women and girls in sports and activities like this. And so then there were fewer of them who went into the field 30 and 40 years ago than there were men. So for people who have been in the field for a long time, for 30 and 40 years, there are going to be a lot fewer women. There's a woman who has been a contributor to Girls Come Strong and spoken at some of our events, Dr. Susan Kleiner. She, gosh, in the late 70s, early 80s, actually had to create a PhD program at her school for the field of nutrition science. And so she's a PhD in nutrition science and a registered dietitian. And she was the first nutritionist in the NFL, the National Football League period, not just the first woman, but the first one period in the 90s. And so in general, it's a younger, it's a, it's a newer field. There are going to be a lot fewer women who have been in it for 30 and 40 years, like the men who got into it in the very beginning. And then like we know about representation, the fewer people that you see who look like you in an industry, the less likely you are to feel like that's an industry for you or like where you belong, right? So if you look at STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, there's been a huge push over the last 40 years, at least in the United States, to get more women and girls into STEM. But that has taken legislation that has taken corporate, um, you know, programs and stuff that's taken like money being invested into it's taken a whole lot of um, a whole lot of effort from the bottom up, top down and the outside in and the inside out to get more women in the STEM field. And now there are significantly more women in STEM, but it took a long time. And it took a lot of effort. So I'd say I absolutely think that there are fewer older female coaches in the field for a lot of reasons. It's a young field. There were a lot more men in it for a long time. When there are primarily men in there, then women are less likely to join. When women do join, when it's a male dominated environment, maybe there's things happening in there that they feel less comfortable or they're not wanting to assimilate into that culture and they end up leaving or they're in there. They're not assimilating to the culture. They're not getting promoted and then they're leaving. Like there's just a lot of reasons why there are fewer, I think, older female coaches um, in the industry. And when there are, they're going to be less likely to be represented for all of the reasons that I was talking about at the beginning beginning. Um, so yeah, I, and the good news is that I think Greg Knuckles posted something maybe six months or a year ago about how when you look at at least again, in the, I think this was US based, you look at the number of women um, and men who are enrolled in different um, programs like kinesiology or exercise science or whatever at you the university level. And you look at the number um, who are enrolling in the different certifications. So the NASM, the ACSM, the AFAA, um, the numbers are actually evening out. And there are actually a few more, if you include group fitness instructor certifications, there are actually more women enrolling. So the good news is that the landscape is changing. More women are feeling, um, more women are seeing more women be represented in different places and spaces, places like Girls Gone Strong and stuff are helping them see them get published and, you know, certifying them and and things like that. So it's changing, but I, I definitely think that there's um, there are, it's a very multifactorial why older women in health and fitness, why there are fewer and why they're less represented. And I would love, Marika, you said that was a question you wanted to get in on answering as well. I think there's also somewhat of a fear that um, for older women becoming coaches, that there is an expectation to look a certain way, to be able to perform things in a certain way, um, because when you go into a gym, a lot of the personal trainers are in their twenties. Um, and uh, I, having spoken to fitness professionals sort of a more around my age, um, there's a lot of fear associated with that, um, feeling like there's really not a space there because, well, who's going to want to train with me? You know, you said earlier, you had people saying, go, don't go train with Molly because you might end up looking like her. Um, so some fitness professionals have this fear that, well, hang on, I'm not like super thin, really young. Um, and, what I wanted to say to that is that, I mean, I'll, I'll read 
this comment that Sam has written and she said, I'm 58 in August. So she's a fitness professional. Getting a job in a proper gym was a no, no. I definitely felt discriminated against because of my age. I'm an experienced women's health coach whose fitness startup was twice voted best fitness company in Singapore. Since I moved back to the UK, I've continued to work successfully after building up a reputation in my field. And then she talks about the areas that she works in. And she said, most people feel very comfortable working with me and trust me because they see me as seasoned, but gyms see me as too old. And so I wanted to say like, as a middle-aged woman, I think when we go and look at first personal trainers, fitness professionals, et cetera, that we want to work with, one of the really important things is we want to feel that we're seen, <laughs> that we're visible, that we're being heard. Um, I know from my experiences going to fitness classes or working with PTs, I've had some that have pretty much ignored me, like that's an old lady just in the corner doing a thing and really focused on the younger people. And I think people who want to come to a gym, they don't, they want to be they want someone who's going to pay them attention, who's going to help them work towards their goals. If you're an older trainer who is really good at their job and who has a really good knowledge base, good experience, good qualifications, and who actually listens and works closely with their clients, oh, my God, you can have a hugely successful business. And I don't think age is at all um, a bad thing. And I think a lot of people actually prefer to work with someone who's mature. And an example of that I'll, I'll just mention quickly is there's a a fitness professional in Perth called Lara Marie, and if she's listening, hi. And she runs a business called Indie Fitness. And I see her posts come up quite regularly on Facebook. And I I love this woman. Like she, you might've met her, Molly, because I'm sure she came to the Women's Health and Fitness Summit in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Her personality is stamped all over her business. She runs dance classes. Lara's in her 50s. She's got five or six kids. She is just awesome but I see her putting her cool tunes on and dancing and she has this tribe of people who just want to have fun when they work out and she fills a room like you see her her all the images from her classes people love her she's so fun they make she makes them feel really good and I just think every time I see her stuff I'm like I love what you're doing because she just yeah all her personality is in her business and she clearly loves what she's doing. And every time I see that, I think I wish there was more people like Lara putting themselves out. Yeah. There's also something to be said. I know a lot of clients want to work with someone who has been through the things that they've been through. So I know, I believe it's Hillary Milsom, who's part of our coaching and training women group. And she's a graduate of our Girls Gone Strong Academy and she's in her 60s and she's doing this as a second job. I believe she's retired or mostly retired from her other job. And she had some of the same concerns at first. Who's going to want to work with me? I'm older, you know, I don't um, look necessarily like a quote unquote, like fit personal trainer or whatever, but she's been able to um, find just incredible clients who are so excited to work with her because they feel like she's going to understand them, that she's going to be empathetic to their situation, she's going to know what they've gone through or are going through. Um, and so they're really excited to find someone who they feel like is going to, again, listen to them, prioritize them, understand them, know what they've been through, and be able to speak from personal experience and, um, yeah, just really understand their situation. So I definitely think there's a place for um, yeah, I think there's a place for health and fitness professionals, personal trainers from all walks of life. Again, all, all identities, all ages, all shapes, all sizes, all races. Um, I think that's so important because people want to feel like the person that they're working with understands them. Um, and you know, has some, uh, you know, again, can as with their situation. So, yeah, I think that was a great question. And I think that, you know, especially as we get more health and more female health and fitness professionals into the space, you know, including them in panels, having them write for, you know, like organizations um, recommending that they, you know, speak at at events and stuff. I think all that stuff is, is incredibly important. So that, I don't know where Anthony went. Where's Anthony Um, gone? I don't know. (laughs) Hopefully he'll be back. Um, So we'll just keep going. (laughs) Hopefully he'll come back in. Yeah, there's, a, um, I think I, I talked about her a minute ago, Elizabeth Vino actually put together a list of female health and fitness professionals who can speak your event The because the, hey, there he is, um, the, um, the response that 
that people were often giving is like, well, I don't know who could speak at my event. And she's like, I do. And she made a list of like 154 female fitness professionals who could do that. And she's like, no excuses anymore. Uh, so yeah, so I, I love people who are proactive in creating resources awesome. that will help, you know, help solve that problem. But again, it has to come from top down, bottom up, outside in, inside out. And by that, I mean, like, you know, we need more, more women to join the field. We need more women who've been in the field for a long time to mentor the younger women and create opportunities for them. You know, we need people outside of events to be writing the event director saying, Hey, why don't you have more women? I can recommend some women. And then we need people who are speaking at those events to say, Hey, why am I one of the only women here? We need more women speaking at these events. And I know who you can, um, you know, who you can bring in. So it really has to kind of the pressure and opportunity and, and um, effort has to come from all of those different sides in order to create change. Anthony, are you here? You're here. I right? am here. Can you, yeah. can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yep. I don't know what happened and I don't know what happened with any of the technical stuff. So <laughs> uh, we're just going to, we're still gonna, live on Facebook. Still going. We're still live on Facebook. Um, yes. So if it's still live on Facebook, hopefully we're still live on Facebook. Um, <laughs> it's a shame I didn't get to hear all the things like I missed about a minute or two of what you were saying, but I'm sure that it was gold. That's, that's the problem. Um, the, the thing that I was hearing though from you is that whether you're an older coach or not, an older trainer or not, it doesn't matter because the principles of training still apply. Listen to, listen to your clients, um, you know, help them achieve their goals. Uh, you know, it's, I, I was also thinking, to be honest, that, you know, for example, in Olympic weightlifting, you go find a coach that fits you and just automatically the older coaches, you know, the older, grumpy, overweight, smoking still, sitting in a chair the whole session, not moving, just barking orders at you. Like they're respected coaches. Um, and and when you get a personal trainer, that's almost like, mm, you know, uh, and yet, if, if you were a, a female coach that was like that, you kind of get looked at funny. Um, why haven't you got your nutrition in order? Why haven't you got your body looking on point? Um, and it's just such a unfair comparison to have. So I really appreciated what I did here of that, Molly. Um, I did want to ask just before we leave, um, look, Girls Gone Strong is amazing. Um, and there was, uh, I had some questions about what are you doing, what are you doing during this time? And, and how did you really get here from the online business side of things? You are obviously a trainer and an athlete, um, and you started the blog. We heard about that, but the, you know, the course development and developing a curriculum and launching, uh, your courses and, uh, the, the, the online business side of things for those who want to share their content and their resources with people who would like to learn from them. Could you speak about that and how you're spending your time with the, with the unexpected uh, lockdowns around the world? Yeah, that's a great question. So Girls Gun Strong started in 2011. So by that point, I had been in health and fitness for about seven and a half years. I had already started my gym. Um, I had again been posting YouTube videos and like kind of and helpful stuff on Facebook. And, you know, it's funny, I didn't, um, I wasn't doing that because I like, it wasn't like a strategic kind of thing. It was like, oh, cool. I have some cool videos. I'll, up I'll upload them on YouTube or like, I have some stuff I want to talk about related to health and fitness. I'll put it on Facebook. And um, I had also been really active on some health and fitness forums back in the day before social media was as big as it is now. So I built up a little bit of like a following and some amount of respect and stuff there. And so, um, yeah, so I was comfortable my posting stuff and information online. And then when Girls Gone Strong started in 2011, it started with seven women from all different areas of the health and fitness industry. And we all just kind of had this shared passion for um, what we called preaching the gospel of strength and, you know, strength training to women and it had changed our lives. And we felt like that it could change other women's lives as well. 
And so on day one, you know, we started our Facebook page and we had a thousand quote unquote fans. I hate calling people in the community fans, but that's, it was called a fan page at the time. Now they're called business pages. Um, And then the first day that we launched our website, we had like 17,000 people come to it. And I think, you know, what was so cool about it is that we were really filling this void in the health and fitness industry for strength training information for women by women about women. And so, you know, being able to, to recognize that and be so passionate about it and be able to share how it had changed our lives and, and fill that for other women useful. And so, you know, we started like, okay, we're all about strength training and fitness and stuff and women. And then over time, we started really expanding sort of realizing, oh, if we want to help people, we need to talk more about cardio and nutrition and mental health and sexual health and pre and postnatal health. And there are all of these other we want to talk about. And again, along the way, we just tried to stay really tuned into our community and what their needs were and specializing in women. And so, you know, this pendulum had kind of swung like, like in the process of swinging, right? Like women are delicate and should only walk and do yoga and like weightlifting is not for them all the way over to like women should train exactly like men, you know, and there's literally no differences. Right. And so it's like, hold on a second. Again, like, can everybody just calm down and hold two ideas like together at the same time? Right. There are a lot of similarities in training men and women, and there are really important and unique anatomical, physiological, and psychological differences that health and fitness professionals need to understand if they're going to do the best job serving women. So again, these textbooks, these exercise science textbooks and kinesiology textbooks, what the underlying kind of thing that you don't know about them is, is that they're pretty much written about 18 year old white males, right? Like the information in there that's that's where so much of the information is coming from. So in 1994, the National Institute of Health here in the United States had to mandate that women and people of color be included in studies because we were so underrepresented. Um, and so, you know, again, there were so, that was only 26 years ago, right? That there were so little research. So a lot of the information that was included in these textbooks, again, is about this particular population. So you're reading this exercise science textbook and you get a pair of about pregnancy <laughs> and a paragraph about postpartum, if you're lucky, or a paragraph about the menstrual cycle, right? A paragraph about menopause, maybe, most likely not even. And so we started realizing like, okay, well, there's so much other information we wanna cover. And then we started realizing, holy cow, a large portion of our community are health and fitness professionals who want to change women's lives the way that Girls Gone Strong has changed their life. And so we realized that there was a giant void out there. There were no um, educational resources that checked all the boxes, comprehensive, interdisciplinary, evidence-based, body positive. There are resources out there about working with women, but they often you know, come from someone from a single discipline or they cover one of you know, pregnancy exercise or postpartum exercise or whatever, and they're really good, valuable but we realized that there wasn't anything out there that kind of covered the whole spectrum. So we thought, okay, cool. So we have all these people with different disciplines who are involved with Girls Gone Strong. We have the ability to create resources that are really comprehensive. So for us, it was about just seeing like, where's the void in the industry where women aren't getting what they deserve, whether coaches or, you know, fitness enthusiasts. And so for us, really focusing on women has been really wonderful and important because so many women are realizing that their needs have been underserved for so long by the health and fitness. Industry. And then same thing with our education, uh, health and fitness professionals are realizing they can't be the coach to be if they don't understand um, make anatomical, physiological and psychological considerations of working with. Uh, we get a lot of women who enroll in our pre and post certification, for example, because they had a poor experience with a trainer who didn't understand their unique. And so they're like, I want to be not like that person. I want to, I want to be the person that I wish I had worked with. Or they have a experience with a trainer and they're like, I want to be that same person for someone else. So strong, certain timing had a lot to do with, um, you know, with our ability to, 
done strong because doing it before anybody else is always really valuable. But this just intense kind of laser focus that we had on women, women's health, women's needs, educating women, and then educating health and fitness professionals um, who work with women. And uh, yeah, having, you know, staying really true to our valuing has been really big for our community, um, giving awesome uh, female fitness professionals like Marika, you know, a voice on a platform like Girls Gone Strong, I think has been really valuable, uh, making sure that our community is global, our experts who write our certifications are from five countries so that our information is globally. So I think there are those things, I think any one of them done on their own would not have been a six, you know, been a very synergistic effect, the sum of the parts whatever the whole is greater than the sum of the sum of the part. Um, so being first, having a real laser focus on women, um, you know, staying true to our values, um, really clear in recognizing that there was a massive void in, in by women about women for women, and then recognizing that there were no other comprehensive interdisciplinary evidence-based body positive educational materials for health and fitness professionals who wanted to work with women. I think all of those have, you know, come together to really contribute to the growth of, of Girls Come Strong. Yeah. And, and you can see that, you know, you can, <laughs> yeah. you can see that in um, the content, you can see that, like I, I've been privileged to, to have a look at some of the content and collaborate. So I really appreciate that you, you value the input. And of course, the wiser one, Marika, you know, she's, uh, I love when she does her little <laughs> Facebook lives in the group. I love when she, um, you know, she's contributed to, to the training programs that you have there. And, um, you know, I've learned from both of you so much and um Sorry, and really I was just have appreciated Molly's it. Molly's body language as you asked her that question. You could just see her going, Ooh, ooh. Getting <laughs> all excited. Oh, I love talking about this. And I will say as well, someone who's Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say as someone who's working <laughs> with the team <laughs> they had this time delay. You know, when we were writing writing this this um the content. It was, um, you know, every chapter was was reviewed by multiple people. So, and we were we were ripping stuff apart. Like, you know, it was, no, you know, no holds barred. You know, that we, we would disagree with each other because we had people from different disciplines. And I, as a physio, would come in and say, you know what, I actually don't agree with that. And they'd come back and go, well, check this out, check this research chat, Marie Curie. I'd be like, okay, I'll eat that bit of humble pie, and then we'll go back. And so it was just kind of like put all egos aside let's all just work on this together and try and get the most up-to-date stuff and mm -hmm. that is of the best quality we can. But it was because it was so great. I think the responsibility to um, becomes a, like, it becomes less stressful when you know that you've got four other people reviewing what you write. And then, you know, we had multiple really amazing um, physios review my content. Cause I was like, I don't want to be saying something if there's some, if there's a better way of of getting that information across, or if it's not accurate, but knowing that I had three or four people coming back to review that, so physios and other fitness professionals and you know nutritionists, you know, working as a team was actually really good because it just takes a little bit of that responsibility off as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I also love we'd say this is what the research says and this is you know what the limitations of that are and this is where this is valuable and also this is what people are seeing in their gyms and clinics and studios and hospitals and so like here's all of the information and then ultimately here's our recommendation based on that which I think was really good it's funny that you said that Marika because I was getting ready to say the thing that I forgot to say that I think has um helped Girls Gone Strong grow is that we're only married to the information. We're not married to a product or a supplement or a whatever. So all we care about every day is providing the most up-to-date, most evidence-based, most useful, most practical information to people. And so I think that there's been, you know, it's hard if you say, you know, okay, research says at this point in time that this particular product might help women postpartum, right? And then later it comes out that it doesn't, like, that's really hard if you've built your business on that, you know? And if you have also seen it help people, right? So then you're like, okay, well, we've seen it help people, but the research says this, and what's going to happen to our business and what do we do? And so I think it's been really valuable for us to have only really built Girls Gone Strong on 
delivering the best available information and being really clear that whatever we're providing at any point in time is the best that we know right now. And that people can trust that we will continually update that as we learn more, because it's not about our egos and it's not about being right. It's about providing the best information possible. And, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, I think it's really fun when like, I tell people when they're reviewing the content, like don't hold back because people on the internet are not going to hold back. So like, you better, you better be ruthless now. Cause if you're not ruthless now, people are going to be ruthless on the internet six months after we publish this thing in a hardcover textbook. So yeah. So the joke is always like, be as mean and as ruthless as someone that you don't know on the internet would be on your post, because that's what you have to do in order to, to really challenge the information and make sure that you're providing the best possible content oh and i love that so much you know um not having your identity tied up in the the information that you've provided at this publishing date but hey this is subject to change because really that's all of us right and we're all on that journey um and i love and i honestly i love that about you uh, i love that you're leading girls gone strong that way um I just wanted to do a mini summary of what I heard and distill it down because, you know, not everybody has access to the amazing team that you have. Uh, you've built such an amazing team. Um, what I heard was think about your community and think about who you're trying to serve and why you're trying to serve it. So, you know, from the early days, your blog posts, the sharing your own journey, um, and then thinking about your community um, and realizing that there was a need for a complete, uh, or like a more complete solution because any one thing wouldn't be enough to, to, to generate the success that you had. So uh, think about your community and see the need and then not identify with what you currently believe in, but realize that you're doing the best to deliver what you believe to be the best information right now and that it will be subject to change and it will evolve and just because you did the course two years ago doesn't mean that you know what it is today um which is great and you know having that update um you know for for the people that are out there and they don't have that strong team uh i'm going to guess that it doesn't mean that they can't you know do courses and webinars and things like that uh, what tips do you have for those people who want to, you know, develop a course for, say, antenatal exercise, postnatal exercise, whether it's in their little local community or their Facebook groups, their um, their online community? What do you think the simple, broad brushstroke steps that would be helpful for them to do? Yeah, I think it's um, first of all being an expert in that area, I think is really important, right? Like, um, you know, when we first got into some of this information years ago, like I recognize areas where I was lacking expertise. And so I was able to pull in other professionals. So for me, really staying within my lane and my scope of practice in my area of expertise has been really valuable. I've been asked to contribute to or do things that I feel like are outside my area of expertise. And that's when I'm kind of like, whoa, hold on. I, I just want to stick with the things that I feel comfortable providing information about, or if I'm asked a question that I don't know about, then I say, I don't, you know, I don't really know that or that's not really my area. So I think choosing something you feel like you're in, that you are an expert in and that you have experience helping women in. And, you know, it's funny people, health and fitness professionals are always like, what to talk about? I don't know what to say. And it's like, you probably, if you're working with clients and patients, you get five, 10, 15, 20 questions a day from them. So, you know, keeping track of the questions that you're being asked on a regular basis, because that's the stuff that people want to know about. Those are the people that you're already working with. That's what they're asking about. So developing content that you can provide around the questions that you're already getting, I think is really valuable. Um, being okay with being kind of crappy at first, I think it's also a really valuable thing. Like I was, um, I made a post maybe like a year ago on Instagram. So the first video I ever shot, like where I was actually trying to provide educational information online, I was literally you all leaning up against a wall because I didn't know what to do with my body. I'm not kidding. Literally leaning up against a wall, just like this, because I didn't know what to do with it. So like, that's cool. Like you're going to probably not be great at it at first, whether it's figuring out the tech side of things, 
you know, figuring it, being comfortable on camera, speaking to a group of people. I used to be terrified of public speaking. So being okay with realizing that like, you're not, I know that you're not going to be great at first and just getting those reps under your belt, I think is really valuable. Um, having trusted people to look at the stuff that you're doing and, and test it out would be valuable. So having current clients review what you've done and give you some feedback, having some friends and family review it and give you some feedback, I think could be really valuable. Um, yeah. So I think all of those things are, are really important. So sticking with what you know, you're an expert in you um, creating content around the questions that you're already being asked, being okay with not, you know, being amazing at it at first and just being willing to like, learn and get the and get the reps under your belt and then having trusted people review it and give you feedback I think all of those things are um, are really valuable and one more really practical tip that again very unsexy um, kind of like my nutrition tip but one thing that's been incredibly valuable for us at GGS is um, being really frugal and in our personal lives um, and just reinvesting everything that we've had back into Girls Gone Strong so a lot of you know we released our first program in 2014 around the same time that you know it's kind of like that I would say sometime around there was kind of the height of the internet kind of you know online frenzy affiliate mark kind of everybody was doing people were you know launching these products or programs and you know then then like you know going to the beach and like going on vacation and like you know spending all their money and we were like did not take a dollar. I didn't take a dollar from Girls Down Strong until 2016. And I think my salary in 2016 was like $18,000 or something. So for us, um, and we live in Kentucky, my partner and I, I recently got a, I bought an eight year old car, but before that, my partner and I shared a 13 year old car. Um, so as it, for a really practical tip, we have been incredibly frugal in our personal lives um, at GGS and just kind of, you know, it kept all of the, all of the money in, in the organization as much as possible so that we could help as many people as possible. And it has allowed us to weather storms that we would not have been able to weather otherwise, had we um, acted as if the money coming into Girls Gone Strong was our personal money to live on. So it's been, um, and I, and my partner uh, comes from a brick and mortar store background. He owns a sleep specialty shop. So he also has views finances and stuff different than people who have online businesses. Again, if you have an online course with no cost of good versus you sell a mattress, which has a cost of good, like there's just a different way that you kind of people treat that. So that has been really useful for us as well as um, being incredibly frugal in our personal life and having a uh, someone with a brick and mortar background and understanding of finances and stuff, um, helping with the Girls Gone Strong finances. Yeah, it's uh, Casey's. Casey's great guy. Loved loved chatting with Casey, and uh, you know, I I keep meaning to to see if you'll just spend a little bit of time with me on a call and um, just have a chat about some stuff. Uh, but one of the things that um, I really love about what you do is is that you just put your message out there because it's your voice serving your community. And a lot of the people that I, you know, because I try to encourage some really awesome therapists and, and fitness professionals to get out there and and, um, and put stuff out. And one of the most common things that I hear is, oh, you know, so-and-so already does that. So I don't want to be seen to be copying or so-and-so does this. And, you know, you know, I, I don't want to say the same thing. And I just want to encourage people out there. And I know that, that both of you do too. And, and we alluded to it earlier. The more people that are out there saying the same sorts of good information is, um, is not going to saturate the market. It's actually going to make people sit up and think, hey, maybe there's something in this. And people are going to find your unique message, even though we, like all three of us, could present from a script and it will land with different people in different ways mm -hmm. for whatever reason, because we know that the technical stuff isn't as important as the connection part. And, um, and I just love, um, you know, cause I'm just seeing in the big picture community need message, uh, genuine voice, um, is, is what I'm really getting a lot from what you were saying. And, um, you know, being able to not be personally invested in, in that content which is um 
which is so great. And uh, I was just thinking, Marika, just sidebar so that everybody can listen and hear our sidebars. I'm thinking, you know, we should just do a webinar on, on the online content that we've created, you know, because um, we, we've done that sort of stuff too. And and we've been a part of proce- of Molly's Girls Gone Strong process and the review and there's just so much out there. I, I There are so many great people doing great things. I'm excited. Sorry. Can you tell I'm rambling now? <laughs> but, uh... well, I, I think that it's important too, Anthony. You know, I um, it, it's, it's easy to just like be stuck in our own little bubble and think that this is what the world is like, right? So, okay, COVID-19 happens, you know, it's spreading. People, gyms are closing. People are at home um, and fitness professionals a lot of people have started providing at-home workouts. And so Girls Gone Strong, one of the things that we felt like we would, again, for our community was provide these 60 plus at-home body weight and dumbbell workouts and training programs and stuff. And it would be easy to, you know, number one, if for any one of us in this health and fitness, I mean, I don't know if your all's feeds are filled with at-home workouts right now, but mine totally is. But the, my mom's isn't my aunts isn't my best friends isn't, you know what I mean? Like they might have one or two people who are providing at home workouts on their feeds. Like I'm seeing hundreds of people do it because my community is health and fitness professionals. And so it's really easy to be like, Oh, well, too many people have already done this thing. But like, that's only your perspective because of who your community and who your feed is filled with. But like, again, my mom's community isn't filled with that. My best friend, she was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. This is so exciting. This is great. Like no one on her feed had done that yet, right? So each of us reach, like we have overlap in our communities, but each of us reach a significant amount of people for whom their feeds don't look the same as ours. So I think that, like you said, there's, it's kind of twofold. One, um, I mean, there are still so many women who have, you know, no idea that pelvic health physiotherapy is even a thing, right? So like, there are plenty of people out there that still need to be reached, um, that, y- you know, you don't realize they aren't being reached because your feed is so saturated with it. But on the other hand, same thing that Anthony said, the more people, more places and, you know, wherever they see this message, the better and different people are going to resonate with different providers, Um, providing that information. So I think it's really important to step outside of our own bubble a little bit and realize like, oh, okay, just because I think everybody knows about this thing doesn't mean that they do know about it or doesn't mean that they do have access to it. And one of the things that we've done at, um, at Girls Gun Strong recently is we've been surveying our community members trying to figure out the best way that we can help them. And one of the survey questions that we've asked is, um, have you downloaded our free at home workouts yet? And if so, have you found them helpful, um, you know, et cetera. And so we've, these free at-home workouts, we've emailed them out multiple times. We've posted them all over our social media. We've shared them in the group. We've done all of these things. And um, you there, Anthony? Um, I'm so, still there. So basically I was saying that, you know, we've been serving our community. One of the questions is, have you downloaded our at-home workouts? Have they been helpful, et cetera? And, you know, we've posted these in our groups. We've emailed them to our community. They're all over social media. Like, I feel like people are sick of hearing about them. And like 25% of people like raise their hand. They're like, I didn't even know they existed. I'm like, okay, these are people in our community who are have access to us in a million different ways. We've sent it out all over, you know, the, all of the different platforms that they could possibly see it on. They're still like, I had no idea. So like, you know, just so you know, People are, um, even if someone has done it before, there's a good chance that there's so many people who haven't been reached by it. So I would just highly encourage folks that, you know, if you can be of service to people, if you have education and information to share, if you're passionate about helping people in a particular way that, you know, and you feel comfortable, or even if you feel a little uncomfortable, but you still want to do it, you want to put yourself out there. I highly recommend that you do it because, um, yeah, people could always use, um, yeah, I, I think people sharing their gifts is one of the most valuable things that they can do for the world. Marie Forleo says, you know, that unique gift that only you have, right? Like we, again, might be in the same field, but we all have unique gifts and unique, you know, ways of connecting with people and sharing that stuff. So I think I love that you're encouraging folks to, to do that, Anthony. I think it's really important. Awesome. I just have one more question, Molly, because I am cognizant of the fact that 
even though you're a night owl, it is getting a little bit late there and we've had you for an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, that's not late at all. I keep thinking you're 12 hours ahead. Okay. I mean, well, anyway, we've had, you for an hour. Mm-hmm. we've had you for an hour and a half, so I don't want to hold you too long because I know you're a very busy lady. Um, so I just have one more question and, and it kind of just feeds in really well to what we were just talking about because I think this is something that is massively um, a massive challenge for many people in our community, which is imposter syndrome. Um, so for those who haven't heard of that term, <laughs> I think everyone has, but most of us have imposter syndrome, no matter what level we are in any kind of professional. And I think imposter syndrome as people are transitioning to from their gym space to online and think, who am I to do this? Who the hell do I think I am to think that I can do this and put stuff out there and proclaim to be an expert? Um, I, su- I suffer from imposter syndrome massively, as you, as you both know. Um, I, know. I think many of us do. And I would just love to hear from, from you to everybody just to give us some tips on how we can get past that imposter syndrome, especially if it is crippling us from actually serving the people that need us. Yeah, I think that's such a great question. And my favorite is the double imposter syndrome where you're like, I have imposter syndrome, but it's different than their imposter syndrome because it's really imposter syndrome because I'm really an imposter. You know, like that, like, like double, (laughs) double imposter syndrome. The meta imposter syndrome. Exactly. Exactly. The meta imposter syndrome. So one, I think again, like anything else, even just noticing and naming the fact that imposter syndrome is a thing is really valuable for a lot of people. And then being able to recognize um, when it's happening to you so that you can see yourself having the experience instead of just like, you know, being absolutely crippled by it. Um, I think the thing that I said before about staying in your lane is, is a really valuable thing too. Like I have fallen prey to earlier in my career being asked to speak about different topics or contribute to an article about a topic that wasn't my forte. And so I'd gather all the information or I'd like work with someone else like, Hey, can you help me answer these questions and stuff? And like, that just didn't end up feeling good. I just would rather, you know, do things that I really am an expert in, um, knowing that other amazing fitness professional health and fitness professionals like you with your 22 years of experience have imposter syndrome, I think is also really, really helpful. And then, um, yeah, so recon- recognizing that it's a thing, um, being cognizant that you actually are staying in your lane, um, and talking about things that you're an expert in, um, being willing to say when you don't know the answer to something. I was giving a lecture to, or um, doing a kind of a guest lecture to um, the college class of a colleague of mine that I really respect. And the first question, this was maybe four years ago, five years ago, the first question that somebody asked was not a question that I felt like I knew the answer to. So literally I'm like lecturing to this class. And the first question I'm like, uh, uh, and so I had to just say, you know what, I'm not really an expert in that. Um, such and said, these people are better experts in that, you know, I, you know, here's a little bit that I know about this, but for the most part, I'm not really an expert in that. And you'd be better off asking this person or certain, you know, doing this Google search or whatever. So I had to literally just say, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, I think rec- recognizing that it's a thing. Um, understanding that really smart, talented people have it. And that if you're feeling it, that you are most likely an expert in what you do because the people who um, are very early in their career and think they know everything don't really experience the imposter syndrome. We're getting the (laughs) Dunning-Kruger. Exactly. I always joke about the year 2006 when I knew everything about health and fitness because that was two years into my fitness journey. And I literally thought that I just like, I would just thought I was hot stuff that knew everything. Um, so I feel like the knowing that the more you know, the actually more you realize that you don't know, I think is really valuable. And, um, you know, it just, I don't think imposter syndrome for most of us ever really goes away. Brene Brown talks about having it, you know, she's interviewed 400,000 people, her and her team have interviewed and collected data on 400,000 people. I mean, there's just, it just doesn't go away. So I think all of that stuff's important, staying in your lane, recognizing that it's a thing, knowing that really smart people have it, understanding that the more you know, the more, the, the oftentimes the more that you're likely you are to have it, the less you know, the more you think you know, and the more certain you feel about things that you don't really know anything about. And then, um, yeah, just, just for me, it's been, you know, 
weighing, like my number one value is making a difference. And so I feel like that doing the work that I do can make a difference in people's lives. And I understand that at some points in time, I'm not going to know the answer to something. I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to have to apologize for something. I'm, you know, I'm going to do something wrong, whatever. And saying, okay, I'm willing to accept that at some point in my life, I'm something negative is going to happen because of the work that I'm doing online. But I feel like for me, making a difference is more important than being embarrassed. You know what I mean? Like getting my feelings hurt, you know, whatever, having this negative experience. So for me, kind of weighing those out has been really valuable in deciding that ultimately my main goal is to make a difference. So if I make a fool of myself sometimes, like me, I can handle that. So important, so important. And I love the way that you've, you know, that just tying in that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Um, and just having that feel, if you're having those feelings, you're on the right track. Um, you are knowing more because mm. that's what should be happening when you know a lot more about a topic. Um, and, and, and the same sort of thing, you know, there's so much that you just dropped there, which was awesome. Um, uh, you know, trying to summarize everything that we've talked about in this, ask me anything. It's always been great to talk to you and we've covered so much ground, but we haven't heard to... my favorite family tradition. That's true. That's what is your favorite family tradition? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love that question. My favorite family tradition is going to the beach with my dad's side of the family every two years since like 1987. So I was born in 1984, 1987. My family started my dad's side of the family. He's got their seven kids and they have all married and most of them have kids. So we have this enormous family on that side and they started going to the beach together in yeah in the late 80s and our family has continued to go to the beach together every two years and we rent one of those big beach houses and or sometimes we'll rent a couple of them side by side there's like duplexes so there's like five bedrooms on one side and five on the other so you can like a small group of us going to the beach is like 35 or 40 people a big group is like 60 65 people and they're irish catholic and they are rowdy and they get wild. Um, they get really wild. I might have to actually post a video or two of them in the comment section of this post because it's, yeah, it's, it's hilarious. Um, so yeah, hanging out with them, spending seven or eight days, just all cooped up together in a house, hanging out by the beach, playing our bocce ball tournaments. I have an amazing post from July on Instagram where it's like, I, I was a bocce ball champion this year. Um, so I won, we do like brackets or whatever, you know, and I won and I made a post like holding the bocce ball champion thing. And I was like, it's really important in life to find people who support you in everything you do. And then you swipe and you see my uncle and my cousin giving us the finger. I'm like, these are not those people. Yeah. They're like flipping us off in the background or whatever. So yeah, I have a super awesome family going with them every two years to the beach is my favorite, favorite family tradition on that side. And then Christmas with my mom's side of the family, my grandmother who passed away a few years ago, always made Christmas incredibly special. So yeah. So doing Christmas with my mom's side of the family, eating grand Marnier French toast and uh, sausage, egg and cheese casserole and opening presents. And um, yeah, that stuff with my mom's side of the family. Those are, those are my favorites. That's what a great family tradition, you know, um, and going to the beach we love going to the beach. Um, Marika, I want to know what your fa favorite family tradition is too, because, you know, you've got lots of good stuff. Like, you've got your weekly thing that's been really valuable. We've we talked have, about that. Uh, well, Sunday dinner, It's it hasn't been every Sunday, but with my mum and my parents, um, my brother, when he's around, he sometimes comes. My other brother is in Denver, Colorado, so unfortunately I don't get to spend a lot of time with him. Um, growing up, I'd say, <laughs> how Australian is this, um, playing cricket on Christmas Day was like our family tradition. And one particular year, I remember we no one bought the cricket bat, which is just stupid, but we had stumps, we had everything. So, Molly, the stumps are the three little wooden pickets that uh, sit vertical and they've got a sharp end. So my uncle one time used the stump as a cricket bat. <laughs> he slid in for his run. It wedged into the ground. Anthony can see where this is going. The pointy end ended up in his leg 
Um, and he ended up in emergency care on Christmas Day with this huge wound in his leg. <laughs> um, but, yeah, cricket cricket on Christmas Day with my family, all the classic catches and silliness. Um, usually people, it was classic catches because you had a beer in one hand and you're trying to catch with the other and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, my family probably uh, not quite to the extent of yours, Molly, but my, my family allowed. Um, they're very funny. They don't mind a little bit of alcohol. Um, and lots of food and yeah we have we have really good times together actually <laughs> yeah my favorite my favorite family tradition um, is Christmas uh, on my dad's side of the family uh, I'm one of 24 in my generation so you know I have like 21 cousins and now we all have families and stuff like that so not everybody can join and, and people have moved away of course but um, one of the, yeah, so many of my memories are hanging around with my cousins, just doing stuff, backyard cricket, the classic catches, um, you know, and then my uncle had a pool. So if it wasn't at my uncle's house, because uh, six out of eight, my dad's one of eight, six out of eight lived in Sydney and they live like within five, 10 minutes drive of each other. So um, if it wasn't at Uncle John's house, we all turned up at Uncle John's house after lunch and we all jumped in the pool because it's summer, right? And it's like 85 degrees, 90 degrees out. And so we'd jump in the pool and um, have lots of fun. More classic catches because you get to dive dive in and, you know, we're trying to make it hard for people. It was all fun. Um, and, and wanting that for my kids as well. And, um, of course... We didn't have screens you in those days. You must have had a good bombing competition. So a bombing competition? Yeah. Oh, when we, my uncle used to get mad because we'd do the synchronized bombing, which creates a massive wave and all the water leaves. And it's like, hey, don't, don't chuck all the water out of the pool. But, uh, but yeah, it was, um, it was really, really good fun. Um, so that was a good question. And thank you for remembering that, Molly. Um, so thinking about everything, and you know what, that question perfectly epitomizes what I think I'm getting from this podcast, which is connection. It's, um, so we've got connection. Your self, your self worth is not tied up in what, what you do. Um, and if you do, if you do have that, you know, diversifying what builds up what you identify as, as a person, you know, uh, we were talking to, Ju uh, Dr. Julie Granger recently. And, and, um, one of the things I couldn't remember if she said on the podcast or, or before or after the show was, um, you know, if you got locked in syndrome and you couldn't get, you know, you couldn't communicate with the outside world, you're still worthy of love and respect and kindness and care because even though you can't do anything and you have nothing, um, you're still worthy as a person of love, mm -hmm. kindness, respect, care. And I thought that that was brilliant. And if we can just remember that, um, you know, so in your personal journey and seeing how, um, how you had some of those things and, and, and how you've been working on it and the importance of therapy, you know, you've said it each time you've been on it's, it's been really beneficial and it works. So um, thank you for being vulnerable on the internet. Um, so, so having that um, and, and a lot of the questions and the answers around those questions that we dealt with today have come back to something like that. How, how do we see ourselves? How do we relate to our community? Um, and even in the programs, you know, I love that, uh, you know, you, you have the physical aspect of it. And then you have the nutrition aspect, but it's also the psychological aspect. And yes, lots of things are similar to training guys and lots of things are different just because they are in training women. And so understanding the generality and the breadth of knowledge and being able to apply it to the person in front of you. And you, you get to know those people through generating community and interacting with your community, keeping them in the forefront of your mind, which which gets you to do things like develop this coalition, um, you know, because you know that your community needs these sorts of resources. So why not band together and develop these things? So I really loved how that came out right at the very start. And, um, you know, this whole big picture and even developing the courses, um, 
thinking about your community, thinking about the questions, keeping a track of the questions. Um, it's okay to say the same sorts of things because the message will land. Um, I love the fact that you said everybody's doing, uh, you know, our feeds are full of people doing workouts. But the thing is, is that we don't realize that other people's feeds might only have one fitness professional on it. And that could be the difference to encouraging people to do a workout. So yes, even though everybody's doing it, do it because there's so many people that aren't getting what we see because we've got tons of health and fitness professionals as part of our as part of our feed. Um, and there's something know, like eighty percent of people in the U.S. who don't even get you know who don't even exercise regularly, like eighty five percent or something of people in the U.S. So there's still a significant need for that influence from health and fitness professionals to to reach those people. So yeah, yeah. And you know what? Somebody might not like my workout, but somebody might like my friend's workout. And so, you know, just being able to share and support each other by saying, I am doing this stuff, but maybe you don't like it and that's okay. So please share it because somebody might like it that you know, and I'm sharing Marika's workout. I'm sharing, you know, whoever's workout because I like what they do too. And you might like what they're doing because it's actually different to what I'm doing. And let's just support each other as a community. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, being frugal financially has helped in this difficult time with uh, COVID-19. And it, it's allowing you to pivot and, and just naturally because you've got that business experience of having to pivot quickly and having to um, adapt to rapidly changing things. Um, it, it's... Uh, it's allowed you to also do that to meet the needs of people. And so if anybody's feeling insecure about that or finding this period difficult, um, you know, I love that. Can you see your next step? Just take a step, just take a step forwards. It doesn't matter. And you're not alone, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked about community. You've talked about your community. Um, you're not alone. We're here to support you. And, um, and that's why I honestly, genuinely love chatting to you, Molly. It comes out so strongly that we can pick up these big, broad themes every single time. And um, and it's so, like in marketing talk, because I just did a whole bunch of marketing stuff last night for eight hours, you know, it's so on brand, it's on message, it's a part of, it's Girls Gone Strong isn't what you do um to sell an image of yourself, Girls Gone Strong has come out of you and your personal journey. And it's a it's a great reflection of who you are as a person. And um, and that's, I think that's my summary for this episode. How did I go? <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much for those kind words and for summarizing um, what we've talked about over the last couple of hours here. And I always appreciate being on the show with you all, not just again, because I respect you as colleagues, but also, you know, enjoy um, having a friendship with you outside of just the work that we do and appreciate, yeah, just how compassionate and empathetic and caring and connected you all are to me and to your um, clients and patients and to people, you know, within the Girls Count Strong community. And I love how much you all add to the GGS community by being part of it. So, so many people in our groups learn from you all on a really regular basis. So. Thanks for thanks for having me on and thanks for increasing the frequency of the podcast because I know it's going to probably be a lifeline for a lot of people who are, you know, struggling right now. So, yeah, totally a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, for those thanks. who are listening, like, share, drop a comment, um, you know, even say some of the things that you really got from this podcast from Molly so that, um, you know, Molly, Molly hears it, of course, but um I know for myself because of that imposter syndrome, it's like, look, I'm, I'm going out there. I'm putting myself out there. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. So <laughs> any comments, whether it's positive or negative, cause I'm happy to, I'm happy to pivot quickly to, um, let us know what you think. And, um, you know, we really appreciate your support. Yep. And I'll make sure that you have the links that you need to the coalition of health and fitness leaders resources and to our free at home workouts and, 
Um, again, there will be stuff within that coalition of health and fitness leaders packet where you have access to other resources to help you build your online business and that kind of stuff. So, um, I'll, we'll make sure that you get the links to all of that and can put it in the show notes for people to benefit from because, yeah, because that'll help, you know, the, the more we can do to help our entire industry stay healthy right now, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, the better. So yeah, thanks for having me. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Well, that's it for this episode. Be sure to hit like if you enjoyed the episode and leave any comments or questions below. We'd really like to hear from you. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so now so that you can be kept notified when we release our next episode. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you back with us for another episode of the Women's Health Podcast.